In this video, we're hoping to explain you more about the concept behind a mega wave uh, and why that information is relevant for you if you're a coach or an athlete. Uh, we're not gonna, in the first part, we're not going to go to the details of actual metrics of the mega wave data. We're going to talk more about the concept behind sort of the methodological point of view of why should you be using Omega Wave in your training process management. But before we go into that, let me introduce you to my colleague, Mr. Val Nesetkin. Uh, hi, so as Mikhail said, my name is Val and I'm one of the founders uh, of Omega Wave. My background, I was a professional athlete uh, back during Soviet days. Uh, I was working as a coach in the former Soviet Union for School of Olympic uh, Development. Uh, 30 years ago, I moved to the United States where I worked as a coach in uh, Oregon, including University of Oregon. That would be uh, track and field or athletics as well as I coach lots of uh, post-collegiate athletes for international duties and uh, national duties. And after I start, we started Omega Wave, uh, my experience also included other sports, including team sports like soccer, basketball, and uh, American football, as well as individual sports. My responsibility primary in Omega Wave was uh, creation of methodology of training, based on physiological assessments that our technology can uh, provide. Thank you, Val, for that introduction. So let's look at the content of this first part. What, do, what are we going to actually talk about? Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, we're going to look at the concept behind our approach to training process ma uh, management. So first, just look at historically uh, how training periodization, training programming has been and why it's been like that, what were the components going into it, and then we're going to shift to our approach and what makes our approach unique, uh, and how does obviously our technology then tie to that. Genetics are uh, what makes us who we are. After that, we apply certain training process to the athlete, and in response to that training process, we uh, hoping to achieve uh, best possible results. All right, so let's jump right into the first topic, which is to explain what traditionally has been the way that training process has been managed. What are the components going into that equation, if you will? So Val, please, could you explain what are these four uh, circles that we are showing on this slide. Why these four and, and, and what's the logic behind the flow? We are familiar with uh, primary training methodologies that are used around the world. Uh, all of them, uh, at least in the original form, originated in the former Soviet Union. In particular, periodization uh, by Professor Matveyev and blood training by uh, Berkashansky. Both approaches were pretty simple, even though they had a certain type of differentiations, but the concept was very simple. Uh, those approaches were empirical approaches that primarily uh, relied on knowledge of training process. And the object of control of those approaches, as still is, is the training process itself. So, as you can see on this slide, uh, that's where the training process is in the blue because mm -hmm. the primary uh, objective for classic periodization or block training is the training process itself. And what we do, uh, we basically measure results uh, at the end of every, well, depending on the philosophy, every microcycle or primary it would be every uh, microcycles, we have certain type of tests where we measure results and based on the results we obtain, we adjust our training process. So uh, as we can see those arrows on this slide, uh, we do the training process to achieve results, the arrow on the top, and then by measuring results, we try to adjust our next microcycle or uh, microcycles of training 
And that way we control training process according to periodization or block training. Now, Val, given your wealth of experience in coaching, both from the East and, and here in the West, what in your experience and in your opinion is the main limiting factor of this approach? Well, we quite well aware about different type of technologies and methods to measure the results. So we utilize in stopwatches, we utilize in uh, measuring tapes, we utilize in new type of technologies like video analysis, uh, GPS, uh, all kind of accelerometers, because we can fairly easy now to measure the uh, results or outcome of training. Well, Val, based on what you've seen, what are we actually then collecting when it comes to understanding the training process, when it comes to understanding the results? What kind of data points are we collecting in the world of sports at the moment? And what is the missing piece that people out there should uh, measure as well in addition to these parameters? And that's the great question. And I think uh, this question wasn't much answered until we uh, created uh, our technology. Because as a follower of classical uh, systems myself for many years, that's what I uh, trained uh, myself. That's what uh, we studied in college. Uh, uh, I used uh, all of these methodologies that, again, primary concentrate on training process itself. So I used classic periodization after uh, working with uh, Berkashansky, I switched more to block training and uh, it was somewhat successful, I would say, uh, and we didn't know anything else. One important part was missing, of course, is the uh, daily assessment of the athlete. Because what happened as uh, we invented uh, Omega Wave. My responsibility was to uh, use those methods to measure athletes on a daily basis and make sense of the information that was collected. And most importantly, utilize that information to create a new approach to training. And uh, the problems with classic periodization and classic block training were very apparent as soon as we start testing physiological cost of every training session. So our technology allows us to uh, measure people between uh, physiological responses uh, prior each workout. And it only took us originally between uh, two and let's say 10 minutes, depending on the type of systems we wanted to measure. And as we started experiments by measuring athletes before every workout, it created quite a uh, chaos in uh, my head as a coach because even though I applied the same exactly training session to group of athletes uh, according to classic periodization or block training, the daily assessments indicated very, very different type of responses in these athletes, even though the load was identical and athletes were pretty much the same level, uh, professional athletes, right? With uh, the same level of development, which uh, created kind of a confusion. So if we have in the same exactly load applied to similar type of athletes in the same event, and we see completely different responses to that training. At first, uh, of course, what we needed to investigate, are those responses actually any good predictors for performance and uh, uh, probabilities of injury, let's say, right? Because if not, then who cares how they respond? Of course, what we found over the years, and there is enough research finally published, that in fact, those physiological responses that indicated how athlete adapts to each individual training sessions were the best predictors of the long-term outcome of training, success of the athletes, as well as the probability of athletes uh, 
overreaching, overtraining, and uh, in some cases, injury. So now we understood that those parameters were as important as any other parameters we measured uh, before, just by results and the load itself. In fact, when we talk about uh, causation of things, results or injury, these uh, parameters end up being the key parameters that will determine success or failure of the athlete. It's not the training session itself or uh, short-term results we achieve using training session, but rather the how athlete adapts and what kind of biological cost they pay for training session will determine how successful uh, athlete will become. So we understood at the time that it's absolutely crucial for us to optimize training. We need to adjust training based on the individual needs of athletes, single athletes, or a team physiological state as a whole. And that lead us to thinking that we need to create a different type of uh, methodology of training or uh, basically we needed a shift as you can see on the mm -hmm. next slide toward more individualized approaches so okay well that's good so you're saying we need to uh, approach training process management in a more individualized way so if we then go back to our original slide where we had those four circles that gave us the flow of of what constitutes a training process and what gives us results, where should we then put our focus? How does that picture change? Where should we put our focus on if it's not on the results and measuring results to modify training? Correct. And uh, we are not claiming that uh, those physiological assessments haven't been done before. So, for example, everybody in our old system, Soviet system, required to go to the sport-specific hospitals to get physiological and biological assessments at least a couple times a year. What we do claim, though, that it's a daily assessment that has the biggest potential. So, not just uh, measuring somebody a couple times a year, because in that case, the training process not become uh, or doesn't become uh, truly manageable. Ideally, we have those physiological uh, responses, adaptive responses and biological cost on a daily basis. Because in a modern sport, even one improperly applied uh, training session can lead to dropping success for very important competition uh, occurrence of injury, and so on. So the investment in athletes is so uh, large that we can't afford not know exactly how athletes adapt into our training, even to single training session. Understood. And that's exactly what uh, we try to achieve through creation of new technology and methodology, how to allow the athletes without going to big... Uh, labs and to do extensive tests in their environment within a couple minutes at rest, how we can provide them relevant information to make a proper decision about adjustment of their training protocol on okay. a daily basis. So in other words, even though we're still using the basic principles of prioritization or block training, whatever favorite uh, system you have, because that did, our new approach does not diminish their regional principles of training. What it does, it uh, makes them much more efficient. So what kind of information do we then need from the athletes to understand better their daily adaptations? So we need to measure the effect of training process on the athlete, in which case we normally uh, look at adaptive responses of the athlete. And then in return, when we understand how athletes adapt into every training session, we can adjust on the way back, knowing what type of adaptation athletes is achieving and what type of uh, current functional state athletes is in 
on every day based uh, on a daily assessment. We can adjust the training self itself, training session itself. So if the athlete readiness is high with no limitations, the training session can be of any value or volume or any intensity. But we also evaluate a different type of limitations in athlete's readiness. And depending on what those limitations are, we can provide inf relevant information to coach how to adjust training sessions based on inability of the athlete to benefit to certain type of activities. So this type of approach, of course, as I said, uh, now shows significantly higher rate of improvement with less uh, probability of negative impact of training. You've mentioned a number of times already the, the term biological cost. Now, that's an important term. Could you actually elaborate more on, on what you mean by it and how does it relate to the important concept of readiness and preparedness? Interesting. This uh, understanding of uh, these processes also started with utilization of the first prototypes of Omega Way. And the most important part there, uh, at the time, all the uh, textbooks, and be that Western textbooks or uh, Russian textbooks or Soviet, I should say, as it was a uh, cooperative kind of production of many different countries, um, indicated that uh, preparedness and readiness of the athlete as one and the same. So there was no definition that would differentiate those two terms. Primary. So when we start utilizing uh, the early versions of Omega Wave, uh, that really put everything in perspective. And uh, what we start monitoring, we start monitoring athletes from standpoint of their performance levels and their uh, physiological responses. And what we found out that physiological states very clearly predicted the athlete performance levels. So regardless of how well prepared the athletes were. So we found multiple uh, cases where the athlete would perform extremely well one week, which would indicate the very high preparedness of the athlete, including running their personal bests and showing the great uh, physiological profiles. And then the very next week, a physiological profile would uh, decrease and indicate lower functional state, the same athlete who was very well prepared and proved it by previous competition would show very poor performance. That helped us to separate preparedness and readiness. So you can be very well prepared, but just not ready based on physiological assessment on any given day or any given uh, moment in time. Even though your preparedness as a long-term adaptation did not change, your ability to achieve your higher performance level is limited due to changes in your physiological systems. So that helped me to create this particular uh, concept and, uh, on the paper. So let's start with the red line, the preparedness line, right? Mm -hmm. So a preparedness line would include in itself all the components that make athletes who they are. And depending on event, physical abilities are not always the most important. For example, if we look at soccer or basketball, the most important ability is their sport-specific skill, right? So a sport-specific skill would be part of this uh, preparedness curve. Of course, even if you have excellent preparedness skill or excellent uh, sport-specific skill, you still need to function within a team, if it's a team sport, within a team uh, tactical scope. Sure. And even if you have great individual skill, but you do not feed into their tactical uh, concept, your contribution to team success will be Low. So a tactical component is also absolutely crucial for your preparedness curve. 
But let's say if you have optimal uh, skill, you have a great tactical concept, you still need to have physical ability to sustain this type of performance within constraints of your league. And we know where you need to be. For example, we know exactly where you need to be if you play, for example, in the uh, Champions League in Europe. We have all the data from GPS companies, how many high intensity sprints you have to be capable of doing, how many miles you need to cover and so on and so on. So a physical component becomes a very important part of that uh, preparedness. So this curve is a summary of multiple components that all together create that sports mastery that makes you successful in your sport. And sport mastery is the ability to make right decisions at the right time, be physically fit, have a great technical component, great tactical component, all that makes you the master of what you do. But regardless how well you prepared, it doesn't guarantee what we found a good performance, as I discussed before already. And we've seen that quite often where the teams or the individuals would achieve extremely high performance uh, one week and very, very poor performance the very next competition, a couple of days from that time or a couple of weeks from that time. What we found, that ability was uh, purely based on their physiology. And we call that, that's what we define as readiness. It's changes in those physiological states that achieve, help them to achieve their maximum ability or levels of fatigue, if you want to say. Uh, right. It's a combination of both uh, fatigue, sport-specific capacity. So those parameters change all the time from day to day. Regardless of how well you prepared, your readiness can fluctuate daily, weekly, quite rapidly and quite significantly, depending on type of activities you do. For example, if you are very, very well prepared and you have to cross multiple time zones in the airplane, even if you don't work per se or train, that can affect your readiness significantly as it affects your nervous system function, hormonal function, muscular function. So, as you can see on this slide, we separated the level of preparedness and the level of readiness. Unlike preparedness, that is multifaceted, readiness is purely psychophysiological. So, your psychological or physiological state can affect your readiness, despite of how high your preparedness is significantly. So if I'm trying to prepare people for a particular competition on any given day, the most important part for me to control becomes readiness. And the readiness, of course, can be also called what we call uh, cost of adaptation. And of course, what is it affected by the readiness? Well, it's affected uh, by training load. Therefore, the third component in this model is training load. The higher the training load, the higher the stress, the less the athlete ability to adapt to it or the uh, more need for long-term recovery after high training load, the lower the readiness, the more, more fatigued the athlete is. So for us to forecast probability of good performance, avoid injury and create truly elite athletes, we need to control these three primary components. Load, preparedness, and readiness slash biological cost. The most important one here, of course, becomes readiness because it needs to be tested frequently. Preparedness can be measured only in strategic points, like after each macrocycles or mesocycle of training, right? Right. Because it's a very slow developing uh, parameter, preparedness. It's complicated and slow developing. On the other hand, load and readiness 
or biological cost that this load exert on the athlete should be measured frequently. So we've basically established that there's a need for this more individualized approach to training management. We need to look at the biological cost or in other words the readiness of the athlete on a regular basis to better load his, uh, his weekly cycles, his daily uh, trainings. Now, talking about this readiness then, this biological cost, how do we in the Omega Wave technology actually tell that information to the coaches in an actionable and easily understandable way? Yeah, uh, very good question because for many years we just provided coaches the information on readiness. Mm. Here is your raw parameters for nervous system, cardiac system, autonomic system, pulmonary system, or hormonal system. Here is the ability of those systems to adapt to stress, uh, levels of fatigue, and we stop there. But that didn't help very much because coaches still didn't necessarily understand how to apply that data for daily practices. And so what we decided to create... Uh, we decided to solve their problems with uh, development in technology. So rather for them trying to guess, we tried to create a next level of information that would allow us to give coaches guidelines that easy recognizable, speak in their own language, and easy to apply on a daily basis. So this next uh, slide actually shows that connection between training process and the athlete. So at the bottom, we show that what type of data we receive after each training session. We basically measure how physiological state of the athlete is changing or cost of uh, biological cost, right? We look mm -hmm. at the changes in central nervous system. We look at changes in cardiac system. We look at the cha changes in the energy systems. And by doing that, we understand at any given point, what type of state, readiness state, athlete is at this particular moment. Based on that readiness state, we created a new concept, uh, what we call windows of trainability, or easy term to understand would be a readiness windows, or readiness of the athlete to digest new type of loads in endurance type of training, speed and power training, strength training, or skill training. So, as I said, uh, Windows of Trainability is our kind of trademark uh, name for it, but you can also apply readiness windows as well. <laughs> so, based on the combination of factors that determine physiological state, depending on contributors that... Uh, explain our physiological state, be that nervous system or cardiac system or energy system, we can determine based on analysis of uh, thousands and thousands of uh, athletes that uh, went through this assessment before, how well they can adapt to different type of training, as I said, uh, those windows. So if your window is completely open, your ability to develop this quality is uh, maximal. So you can apply any type of training load you're planning on that particular day. So if you're planning very high intensity load, fine, you can do just that or high volume. But when these windows are uh, sub-closed or fully closed, then you have to adjust your behavior. Well, if window is closed completely, let's say you want to do uh, speed and uh, development of speed and a development of uh, speed can be only achieved at uh, 95 plus uh, intensity of your movement, right? But your central nervous system and cardiac system at this point are in a uh, low readiness state your ability diminishes. So rather than developing speed, you're probably putting yourself at risk of higher probability of injury, and you're still not going to develop it because your body just not capable of digesting that load properly. So the same can be said for any type of windows. It's combination of physiological states that will determine how each window will function, how open, closed, or partially open it will be. 
And then a uh, coach can uh, look deeper into it. Under each window, there will be precise descriptions on how to adjust training session in this particular uh, window to gain maximal results. And we're not teaching coaches how to coach. That's the reason they're coaches, because they're good at what they do. We're just providing them crucial information and guidelines that will allow them to make their own training philosophy a lot more effective. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Val, for that uh, very insightful explanation. I hope all the viewers now understand better what goes in behind the Windows of Trainability graph or concept. Uh, why is it relevant for you? Now, in the next part, we will look uh, deeper into the technology and the parameters we show you so that you can make better decisions based on the data and obviously understand better uh, all the parameters that we show.